Greetings. I see so many friends in this room, even though it's dark. It's wonderful to be here. Thank you for having me back. Thanks to Tzvi, the whole team, Scott, the whole crew. Um, Bloomberg Capital, for those of you who don't know, early stage venture capital fund. We're focused on um, enterprise software, and that led us into fintech. And so today I'm going to talk a little bit about future fintech as we see it. Happy to have disagree or et cetera after the drinks, preferably with a Jameson and Coke. Um, last year, let me, oh, do I have to select this? Okay. Last year, we did a slide. How do I do that? Do I do this from here or? Okay, there it goes. One, two, and oh, you can tweet. See all those little hashtags? Very good. Thank you. Um, last year, we did a survey. We commissioned a survey. There was a thousand, uh, I believe it was a thousand um, Americans, average consumers, about the impact of fintech and innovation, technological innovation in their financial services world. Here's what we found. First, some good news. Fintech, people think, is going to help them gain more power over their finances. That's obviously a good thing. Then, not so good, small businesses, many of you in this room, especially after the financial crisis, and we'll talk about it later, face a lot more barriers trying to get loans or just get things done. It's tough out there. Uh, on the good side, again, they do feel that uh, Americans will be better off financially using Fintech. It's, it's, a, it's an efficiency tool that people recognize. That's a good thing. Here, consumers already preserved by two-thirds, 66% uh, want to handle their financial dealings online. Not all can, but they want to go there. And again, that's good for startups, bringing new things in. And here they provide services, this is fascinating, that were only available to the wealthy, to the Goldman Sachs private clients that maybe many of you are lucky enough to use. But today, some of these technologies can be used and harnessed to get that leveling of a playing field and so that everybody has a fair chance. Uh, to pay their loans on time, get the true fee structure of what you're being charged by mutual funds, to have uh, asset management on a robo basis, all these kind of things that only wealthy could have, now a lot of people can have. And then last, um, they feel that physical branches are kind of over, and the time is to move forward toward a much more online, automated way. Okay, so next question obviously is, where do we go from here? Where do you, who are startups, Go, where, who are you um, as users? Where are you small businesses that need to borrow and transact and manage uh, things? And where do the major incumbents go uh, going forward? Okay, so we sort of broke it down into three categories or segments. First, it's not a zero-sum game. That is uh, across the board. We believe a lot in partnering. partnering and we're seeing um, where there used to be what I call non-invented here, NIH syndrome in many financial services firms. Today, they're coming to the startup community and saying, we want you, we need you, we'll partner with you, et cetera. Um, corporate uh, financial services, uh, that's the big ones. Now, these are the folks that are you know, Bank of America, Goldman Sachs, et cetera, American Express, all these huge, wonderful, giant organizations that have served us well for years. And the, the issue for them is if they want to do well, they're probably best to double down in this corporate um, area, the, the major uh, customers um, selling to them complex, difficult um, products and services that are hard for startups to compete with. They often require a large balance sheet. There's often a lot of regulatory scrutiny here, and they often depend on very serious and long established relationships, decades old relationships. So these are where the big folks will continue to dominate. The next area is where we, Bloomberg Capital, think there are the most opportunities uh, at the moment for change and disruption and, and, and startups to really take the field. This is partly because <clears throat> after the 2008 crisis, the government's solution was, in my view, worse than the problem. Um, and so the, the regulatory burden that has descended on the banks and service providers is so onerous. Some of us see 50 to 70 percent of operating uh, expenditures in IT or in other areas being sent for just compliance and legal and, and, and this kind of corporate regulation stuff. It leaves very little room for innovation. So that means the room is open for the startups here to think about helping these larger institutions or taking the field themselves. So it can be partnership, do it yourself, or um, cooperate in some fashion. And so the, the SMB area is extremely open to um, startups. Here's the areas that we're seeing opportunities in. Tools for lending, payments, operations, underwriting, a related area, but very important for, cyber, uh, for fintech, you can understand cybersecurity, 
And then the whole regulatory and compliance, they call it uh, reg tech today. Um, know your customer is one example. Uh, and then even also into asset management. All these are areas that can be very disrupted, already are. There are some big winners starting. And we think, luckily, we've, we've backed a few of them, uh, both here and in Israel and in, and in Europe. Um, this are contends, these are an area we think that ten, trends will continue. That everything is laid out for this to be a disrupted area. Uh, the the, the, the regulator, regulators care less about it than they do about consumer things, so it's easier for that point of view. Doesn't require such large balance sheets. All these opportunities, again, accrue to the benefit of startups. And smart, large corporations that will partner with uh, and do things together. Because really, cost of customer acquisition is the toughest thing for startups. The big companies have that. If you can make a, t a coalition where they bring the customers and you bring the tech to serve them more efficiently, cut the cost for the large guys, uh, get your cost of customer down, it's a win-win for both sides. And then we go to the consumer side. And here, <clears throat> this is in the US and Latin America, probably Europe, um, banks traditionally sort of made money at one end or the other. Uh, you could say they made money from the carriage trade and the exploit exploitative trade. I just saw the statistic the other day that banks made, I think, $35 billion on overcharge fees for cash, you know, checks that bounced last year. A lot of people consider that, that um, sort of exploitive. I think it comes actually from overregulation that caused them to force to get their money that way. But anyway, the main point is that this consumer area is highly regulated. Um, and the one benefit, I think, for startups is that it, we're seeing a leveling of the playing field technology is bringing. Um, you know, Occupy Wall Street people were protesting against a perceived real problem about inequality and the rich have all, it's a rigged system, and et cetera, et cetera. And to a certain degree, there's some truth in it. But the problem is the solution is probably not tearing down all of capitalism. The solution is probably technology that makes things cheaper, faster, and better for the average person through the use of smartphones and algorithms and platforms that allow you to have, again, the benefits that were previously only available to private wealth management. And so there we see, again, uh, systems that can pay down your loans automatically so you never miss a payment. Think about that. They will optimize so you can pay a little bit extra every month and shorten the duration of your loan, reduce the total amount of interest you're paying, things of that nature, which again, you had a uh, family office, they would do it for you. This does it algorithmically, very inexpensively. Underwriting is being completely transformed by the automation idea. Instead of little people in green eye shades being accountants and doing underwriting in a bank on the local street, of Main, Main Street in the States, for a, a consumer. Now it can be done algorithmically, often sight unseen. People who don't even have bank accounts are benefiting from this kind of thing too. So a lot of opportunity here. Problem is regulators. Regulators are always nervous about the consumer being fleeced. And so the regulatory burden is tougher for startups entering this area. And we've seen a lot of um, trouble in this area with you know, some big famous companies, I won't name them, but you know them in the consumer lending space. Some of them happen to be headquartered in San Francisco. Okay, um, moving on. Then I would say, can't talk at the Israel uh, conference for dealmakers without mentioning what's Israel's role in cyber tech. And I will go back to a prescient lecture I, talked to, I gave about 16 years ago in Israel uh, at a, a conference there. And I said, Israel should be a leader in fintech. It has all of the right backgrounds. It had you know, a history of the Jewish people's financial literacy and acumen. They were trading networks from diaspora thousands of years ago. Um, and they you know, spawned people like the Rothschilds and the Montefiores, the Safras, Goldman Sachs, Lehman Brothers, all these groups. In fact, Neil Ferguson, the great uh, historian of finance, said that the Jews basically invented uh, finance um, in the modern world, uh, in the bond market, stock market, a lot of the trading things that, that have um, helped serve us so well uh, for the last two centuries. So there's that basis. Then there's math and algorithms, a lot of it due to sort of love of learning that comes from that Jewish culture, and then the military training that comes from Shemona Matai and Shemona Mechad, uh, the groups that you know that do the super cybersecurity as well. Very related fields, cybersecurity and fintech quite, quite um, parallel, and you can cross-recruit if you have people from those backgrounds. Innovative culture. I think that's something that Yossi Vardy talks a lot about. It's a country of why and why not. Um, Uri Levine says, you know, finding the right problem is the best, best, best uh, gift. 
those are the kind of ideas that help bring us forward and, and challenge big established uh, industries like fintech, uh, like financial services, with new innovation. International networks. The first international networks, again, that people would think about traditionally were the diaspora networks, where immigrations of Jews from London or New York would leave a cousin or an uncle there that knew people at the right places, and so there were these trusted bond networks for decades. That's being replaced today, not replaced entirely, but augmented, I would say, by international multinational corporate networks. Intel, headquarters in Santa Clara, huge operations in Israel. Teva, headquarters in Israel, huge operations all over the world. A lot of companies are now cross-fertilizing and Israel's benefiting enormously. So you have, within Israel, a DNA and a perspective that is more global than many countries that are more isolated or isolationist in their economic uh, practice and their, and their tech um, ties. And then finally, um, there's this um, perspective of uh, Israel and, and financial stability. This is a story that's not been told, and I have to end quickly, but basically Israel for the past 40 years has had one of the stronger and better growing economies with low inflation and, and very few crises uh, over the years. And so the answer is adapt, adopt, which means adios in Hebrew. Thank you all. <clears throat>